Welcome to Hispanic Biz Success Stories. I am Homero Galicia. We interview successful business owners who have built wonderful businesses to learn from them their story, why and how they started their businesses, and what challenges they faced and how they overcame them. Today, we have a very special guest, a lovely lady, Elodia Purchase Adamson, who owns Ella Blue and some other businesses. Thank you so much for being with us, Elodia. Yeah. Oh, thank you for inviting me here. It's my pleasure. It's quite a pleasure. We've wanted your story for a long time. Tell me about your businesses. What are your businesses? We have Ella Blue on the West Side, which is boutique and bridal and gifts. And then we have Bridal Novias by Elodia across Yellow Vista Mall, where we have bridal quinceañera and, of course, our famous evening wear that Elodia has been known by. And then we just opened Brights and Social Outlet, which is on South Desert Boulevard across from Helen of Troy. And uh, we opened that about eight months ago to help the community. And uh, it is designer dresses at 75% off and some even 90% off. Wow, and to help the community, that's why you have a discount. Yes, because after 33 years in business, I have incredible connections, and so people know that uh, we love giving back. El Paso and Juarez have been wonderful to us, and so we feel fortunate that we can say everybody deserves a beautiful wedding, a beautiful quinceañera, and a beautiful prom dress. And if the girl cannot afford it, we want her to look fabulous anyway. And so we opened an outlet for that reason. Elodia is a brand name. Well, I've been fortunate enough to wear after 33 years in business, when they hear Elodia, they go, oh my God, she's, she's in fashion. I am now dressing uh, grandchildren and they come in for Holy Communion dresses and baptism of uh, ladies that I dressed as uh, that were my brides. So I've been really um, happy with that. Well, tell me about, about yourself. Um, where did you grow up? I grew up in Juarez and was, um, my parents never spoke English, so they wanted for their children to speak English. So they would drive us to Jesus and Mary uh, school, and then we moved to El Paso, and I went to grade school in Cedar Grove, and then went to Isleta High School, and uh, finished at UTEP. Your father had a business in Juarez? Yes, he had Perches Funeral Homes and La Paz Funeral Homes. And they still operate? Yes, we are very fortunate. I can actually tell you they've been in business, uh, we have been in business 57 years, and we are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and have never closed a day. Wow, all those years. Um, so coming to El Paso from, from Juarez, uh, that wasn't any different for you? That was part of your life? Was it a cultural difference? It, because I was 10 years old, I was able to adapt very easily. And uh, I cannot tell you that it was difficult for me because I had already learned English at Jesus and Mary, so when I entered the public school, it was different that it was a boys and girls school, but other than that, it, uh, I cannot say that I had a difficult time. How many brothers and sisters? Uh, we, are, we are a large family, and uh, so we're a family of eight. Okay, fine. And, and, your, and your mother, was she a housewife or did she work also? We grew up to where both of our parents had to work, and my mother always helped in the funeral home, in the chapels, and um, taught us how to save money. By that I mean grew, we grew up having so many children, we were never able to bite an apple in whole. We had to share it and cut it in four. If we ordered a soft drink, we would have to share on the table. And I mean, to the point of we grew up where we never had a sunny side up egg. It had to be scrambled so she could add potatoes and onions because that way she could feed more children with less money. Uh, we economized and that is how I grew up. Um, knowing that 
we had to save uh, in everything we do. I mean, I grew up in a three-bedroom home, so at that point we were only six kids. That meant three per bedroom, and um, that was just part of life, and I think it has made me what I am. But it was a good family life. It was great. It what, was great. What was your fa father like? My father was a workaholic, and I learned really my working habits from him. He would say a business is like a bicycle. If you don't continue pedaling it, it will fall. And so he instilled that on us. He always wanted for us to follow our passion. He never said, join our business. He always said, I wanted to make him happy. And I said, what do you want me to study? He said, you study what you are going to be the best at. Whether you are a plumber, whether you are a hairdresser, whether you are a teacher, just be the best and you will succeed. He started his own business yes, from scratch. Yes. Uh, that's an unu unusual business to get into. Really it is. He had had other businesses. He had only gone to the sixth grade. And uh, he, in essence, was kind of an orphan because his mother passed away when he was five. So he went from family to family, uncles and aunts that would take him in. And um, he uh, had different businesses along the way. He grew up with a uh, Japanese family, the Kasugas, and he learned his work ethic from them. And he had gone broke, and somebody said, you should open a funeral home. And really, at that point, we were six children, and he had to feed six children, and that is how we ended up in the funeral home business now 57 years later. Wow. So he started on a a new business venture with, with a family to feed. Yes. And, um, and, and, and your family are all involved in business? Or? Uh, my family is, uh, one is a doctor, one is an attorney, um, one is a professor, my other sister's a teacher, uh, my brother has the Perches Funeral Homes and La Paz Funeral Homes here in El Paso. We all work. My other sister's a real estate agent, and uh, only my brother and I live here in El Paso. Everybody else lives in different cities. Around the U.S. and still in Juarez? All in the U.S., uh, from San Francisco to San Diego to Houston, you name it. Wow. And your mother is still alive. Yes, she is. She's what is 82. she like? Oh, she is wonderful. She is lovely, with a great personality, with um, just a lot of moxie. She's a people person and uh, knits a lot at this point in her life. How many children do you have? I have two daughters, Sofia and Andrea. And what do they do? Sofia started really Ella Blue in the Elodia building, but before that, she was my neighbor here at Bridal Novias, and Andrea works in our office doing paperwork. So you grew up in a family of you grow up in a family business and you extend the family business into your family. Yes, I didn't force them to, okay? <laughs> it was yes. their calling. Well, oh, but that's, <clears throat> that, and, and so tell me about, um, I guess your, your, what was a grade school and high school like for you? I was really a nerd. I am one of those people that was never invited to homecoming or prom or really ever even went to a football game. So I cannot say that it was, um, it wasn't easy because you're talking a person that was not popular at all. But um, I got good grades and that was what was important to me at that time. So here you are, you, your father has a business in Juarez, you live here in El Paso later you know, we were later elementary and in, in high, in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't grow up privileged. Absolutely not. I uh, grew up wearing hand-me-down clothes all through my life, and uh, I see nothing wrong with that. And as a matter of fact, I think it is, um, I think I 
had a cell phone. Of course, they didn't exist at that time, or did we grow up with computers or anything like that? Um, we did not grow up privileged. We um, always believed in saving money and that to get where we wanted, we had to work at it. I remember sometimes my sister, when I would pour soda in a, in a glass, she would make sure that they were all even. Oh, we left. did the same thing. <laughs> Nobody could get more. <laughs> <laughs> you had to be, be share and share alike. Um, so, so out of high school, then you go to, to UTEP. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, what was your experience there? My first year at UTEP was fun because I met some friends that I had gone to grade school with at Jesus and Mary. Most of my friends from Cedar Grove and Desleta, really, I did not meet at UTEP. But I had the urge to do a study abroad. And so I went to the counselor at UTEP and asked uh, if there was a program. And um, I then decided to go on my own for a month to France. My father uh, felt it would be good for me. My um, father was very open-minded in that respect. Really, I went without a reservation and didn't know what I was going to do other than I had a return ticket. And uh, what was one month ended up being a year. And I wanted to stay, and my dad said, well, how are you going to stay? And I went to the Alliance Francaise, saw the bulletin board, figured I could become an au pair, have a place to stay, take care of a child, go to school part-time, and actually get a domingo. In other words, get uh, a little bit of money on Sundays from the family. And then I um, transferred to the Sorbonne and met some friends there. Ended up really not going a lot to school, but rather hitchhiking through Europe. And um, then one of my friends says, let's go to Australia. It was in the 70s when they would actually give you housing. But she ended up having a boyfriend and I was in London at the time preparing our trip to Australia. And there I met a group that was going to Africa. So I ended up in Africa for six months, going through the Sahara and the Congo River. So your adventuresomeness only kept, you kept feeding your adventuresomeness. Yes. Well, tell me about the Africa trip. What was that all about? Well, it was a trip where we were leaving London and driving all the way to South Africa. And originally, they were interviewing people to go on the trip. And so the first questions I was asked was, well, are you a nurse? Are you a photographer? Do you know how to cook? And I had to be honest, none of the above. But I wanted to go on the trip so bad that I finally came up with how I could help. It was an American, an Irishman, and a Britishman. And I said, you men do not speak French, and half of Africa is colonized by France, so I can be the official trans translator. I can get everyone's visas. And really, not that I speak very good French, but neither of them knew anything, so they really couldn't give me a test. And I knew enough to where I could get by. And I ended up being the fourth passenger on that wonderful, I cannot say safari, because it was an adventure of Let's see where the trip would take us. Just wild spirit to go out there and explore that. Yes, never staying in a hotel, staying in tents. And we literally, the group separated when we ended up in um, Bangui, Central Africa. And then um, because I did not own the car, I ended up on foot and ended up with public transportation oh, wow. down the Congo River and then to Zaire and the story of my life. And how'd you get back to, to, to England or where? Uh, I ended up, it was during the time Zaire had just gotten a dictator, Mobutu Sese Seseko, and we had tr traded our dollars to the currents or euros or 
to our to the currency of that country, not knowing that we could not pay an airplane ticket as a foreigner with their currency. So we ended up in a cargo boat for 35 days oh. from Zaire, stopping in the different coasts, and uh, ended up in Marseille, France. Wow. Six months later. So what does an experience like that do for a, for a young girl from Juarez in El Paso? Really, it taught me that at that point I could live with so little. It taught me to appreciate what we have because I saw people that only spoke in tongues, that literally did not have a language down the Congo River. It taught me that they valued one match. Remember the matches with cardboard? We would trade one match for a mango to eat. When blades were like this, they would cut in half and we would trade them. It taught me to value the little things in life that are so important for other people. So, so would you say that that whole experience was arduous? At this point in my life, I would say, or people would look at it, what do you mean you didn't stay in hotels and you didn't take a shower for six months and we bathed in rivers or in sinks or in the oasis? But at that point, I was in my 20s so I saw it as an adventure, an experience, and really it has made me what I am today. And how would you describe that? Well, I would describe it as right now, if somebody tells me to get up and leave, I can actually tell you that my entire belongings can fit in a suitcase. I need so little and I value so much, but for myself, I feel that I love helping people. I love making their days important, whether it is a wedding or a funeral, which are both very important events in a person's life. I know what is important and I feel events are important. So, so in, in that, it's interesting to see how you're involved in people's lives in those important events in their life. Uh, but after, after the Europe experience, uh, did you travel more? Or did you come back to El Paso? I came back to El Paso and I went back to UTEP for a semester, but I wasn't into it. So then my parents went to Merida, Yucatan, and they felt that the city needed a funeral home. So I offered to open it, and I opened a funeral home in Merida, Yucatan. This was before Cancun, even uh, people knew about it. And uh, there was obviously no airport in Cancun. This was about 40, 38 years ago. And I had a funeral home there for three years. I then sold it to my competitor, came back, and ended up going back to UTEP. But my goal was to finish as fast as possible. So I would take 21 hours at a time at wow. UTEP and nine hours at community college. Wow. So I think I did three years in one year in a semester. <laughs> I was like on fire to finish. Why was it important to finish? because I wanted to go back to traveling the world. And my original thought, because I graduated under Latin American studies, was to maybe work at a twin plant in Argentina or Chile, but then I ended up getting a job with Pan Am World Airlines. And that gave me the opportunity to see the world and get paid for it. So you ended up being a uh -huh. Flight attendant. Flight attendant. Yes. So for how many years did you do that? I ended up being based originally my first four years in Los Angeles, and that gave me the opportunity to go to Australia, where I was originally headed to, and um, South America, and of course, Asia. And then the other four years, I transferred to New York, and uh, was going to Europe, India, and Africa. 
And on one of our trips that I invited my parents to in Brazil, I had a sister that was um, studying in Brazil at the time. We went to the market and my dad said, this company is putting you into business. And I said, what do you mean? He says, this is the perfect opportunity for you to start the import-export business. And I said, well, can I borrow $1,000? There were some beautiful rugs at the market that I liked. And he said, absolutely. And so I started my business with $1,000 in a suitcase. So as you traveled with your work, mm -hmm. you would make purchases to bring back. Absolutely, I became a definitely a merchant. So if I went to Australia or New Zealand, I would buy sheepskin rugs. If I went to Panama, I would buy molas. If I went to Peru, I would buy llama rugs. And all carrying it in my bag, in my suitcase. Of course, I didn't have to pay for freight. I didn't have to pay for a trip. I didn't have to pay for a hotel. The company did all of that for me. And so I became a merchant. And literally, I opened a tiny, tiny place just to show my wear. So originally, I would decorate my parents' home, and people would come in. And uh, one day, I'd have a rug. The next day, I didn't have a rug or a picture or anything. I would sell whatever I could get my hands on. So you, you sold? I sold. That was uh, the name of the game. People actually would keep up with my schedule as to when I was returning. And um, then when I transferred to New York, African art became very popular. The beautiful homes of Architectural Digest were started getting decorated with uh, African art. And there was four people in El Paso that were big collectors. And because I felt so at home going to those countries, I would uh, bring African art back. And then I ended up putting them on consignment at the World Trade Center in Dallas. And um, that is how I started my business in the import-export and then on one of my trips to India, ended up buying snakeskin handbags and wallets, bringing them back. And that is how my logo came about. Tell me about your logo then. Well, when I started going to India, I would bring back clothing from snakeskin pants to snakeskin coats to snakeskin handbags. And I was bringing back so much that I was not into retail then, I was into wholesale. So I would set up at the different markets. At that point, Jacob Javits Center in New York did not exist, it was the Coliseum. But I'd, uh, I'd show there, I'd show at the Dallas market, I'd show at the LA market, and I would sell to stores. And um, the snakeskin was what was bringing me the business. So we did a logo, show a little skin this season, and we were known as the place to shop for exotic items. So that's, that's where you began then your business, exotic uh, clothing purses. Yes, and thanks for the home, because everything okay. that I brought, I figured that I could not bring ordinary things. It had to be different, because when you close your shop, like I did, People were waiting, what is she bringing next? What, so everything that I brought had to be different, unique, exciting, and that was my passion. And so how did you find your customer base? How did you develop that? Really, it was word of mouth. I cannot say at that point in my life, I really cannot say it was marketing, and of course, Facebook did not exist. Um, so it was word of mouth and friends and people recommending me and developing a following of a faithful clientele base. So in a sense, you were, you were doing retail? Yes, here in El Paso. I was doing retail, and I would, retail was my subsidy, 
and I was selling wholesale to stores and boutiques around the country. So I would set up at market so in the different uh, showrooms. So how, how big would, would you say that business got, the, the wholesale side? You know, it became such a great business. I actually sold to Nordstrom's at one point in my life that the uh, Sudhir Sabarwal that uh, was my supplier in India decided that if I was doing so well, he would open him, himself a place in New York, and he did. And so I said, well, if you come into New York and are going to compete with me, why would anybody buy from me? And he said, but the U.S. is a big country. And I said, well, yes, but we're going to be in a showroom and we're going to be maybe four aisles down. I said, you come in, I walk out. And he never thought I would do that. But by this time, I had contacted so many suppliers because when I was not in uh, uh, when I was not in New York, I was in LA or Dallas selling. So I had met so many wonderful people. That's when I opened the retail boutiques here in El Paso. So did that mean you settled then here in El Paso after a while? Yes, I did. I continued. Pan Am gave us the opportunity to take time off. And so I took time off. At that point, I got married. I continued working and commuting um, from um, El Paso to New York, and that's not an easy commute. Having to, at, at that point, there was a three o'clock in the morning flight. I'd get to New York at noon to take a nonstop flight of 14 hours that I had to work at four o'clock in the afternoon out of New York. I would do a seven day trip and I would come back with my wares and selling, but I loved it. I never can tell you that I complained, and it was my doing. So I, um, I kind of lost my train of thought when I took my time off. Oh, when Pan Am sold part of their routes to United Airlines, I had the opportunity to take time off, but with the benefit of free trips anywhere unlimited around the world first class. So was that perfect timing? And yes, I did take advantage of that. So here you are an entrepreneur given opportunities that other people wouldn't see. And you really took advantage of that. Yes, I did. And then when um, Pan Am was uh, selling out. Uh, I was bought out with 10 years free travel benefits around the world. And that was music to my ears. So, so here you are, an, an, an adventuresome person. Uh, were you a ping as a kid? <laughs> Not really, I was a nerd. <laughs> you, you were the nerd, you were the nerd. <laughs> but, but, uh, <clears throat> but this adventure really turned into into a business uh, yes. opportunity for you. Yes, it did. And, and you were able to take advantage of that. Very much so. Well, that's a fascinating story, especially about how you took your travels uh, to, to, to lead you to where you saw an opportunity. Uh, but I, I venture to say that you saw a need that people had to have things that, that you had access to. Yes, I, um, I'm always very aware, like people tell me I have x-ray vision and I have my antennas up or uh, my financial headlights on, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but I consider myself a person that I see something and I know if it's going to work. Fantastic. I see a sign and I know if it's a good That's sign fantastic. or not. Beautiful story. We've been talking with, with uh, Elodia F. Petrus Adamson about, about her travels and how she got into the business, a fascinating story. And as we're continuing that, now you, you know, we've learned that, that well, you grew up in, 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 you were born in Juarez and you grew up in both El Paso and Juarez. Uh, your parents spoke uh, Spanish and your mother still speaks Spanish, very little English, uh, but you mastered English, you traveled the world, 
uh, you were an airline uh, attendant for uh, Pan Am, where you started bringing the world um, of arts and accessories and things to to market. Uh, but your father pointed it out to you. Uh, maybe we can uh, continue with that story. Yes, my father pointed it pointed out that by having the opportunity of being a flight attendant, I could get into the import-export business. So I started my business with $1,000 and a suitcase and uh, brought my wares from where I traveled to the city of El Paso originally. So here you are now, uh, after eight years with the airline, was yes. that correct? And, um, and, and you open up a shop in El Paso or what? I opened a little tiny office that I would actually close when I was on my travels. I would put a sign up and I would say, I will be back from Argentina on such a day. And the day I returned, uh, my faithful customers, which really they're like my family, would actually help me open the suitcases. Wow, when you brought them back. Yes. And they would say, I want this and I want that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was returning. Uh, actually, I was already planning the next trip. And how would you figure your markup? Well, fortunately, I was able to get a nice markup because I was saving on the trips. But by traveling the world, I always have been uh, very aware of my surroundings. And so I would go to boutiques. What is it going to sell for? What can I get for it? I think when you are in business, you have to think, what is a good value for the person buying it? I do not believe that you can just say, oh, this is a markup. What is the value? What is it worth? If it's different, if it's unique, if you cannot get any more, more of it, then it has a different value. And I always considered, I started my business doing business in third world countries, and I am still passionate about trying to do that and helping um, cottage industries and people that do things handmade. I'm very big into that. And those are good, uh, good products for you. Yes, absolutely. Of course, I were. Um, I have since developed into day wear, evening wear, bridal. Um, there was a lot more cottage industry when there was home goods, but um, always trying to find the best product at the best value, and really, that is why we have been in business for thirty-five years. So tell me about those early years as you, when you say 35 years, you're talking about opening that, that office or is this a little after? From when I first started bringing in my wares. Okay. I think the Elodia store on Mesa where Ala Blue is located now, we opened that in 1983. I could be confused as to. Uh, so you opened Elodia's on Mesa what address is that on Mesa? Well, I started at Lothia really on Wyoming and Virginia. Oh, yes. But when I started in business, it was 1983. I have since moved. I had a store at Litrevino. I had a little office on Thunderbird. Um, I started small. And we started growing and moving to more of a retail location. So. And so as you move to retail, mm -hmm. your product uh, line changed? Yes, very much so. And why was that? Well, because when I started with um, home goods, then I started with snake skin, then I saw the need to bring in one size fits everybody from Morocco, and then people were wanting more. They felt that if I could they liked my handbags and belts and clothing. Why couldn't I bring them uh, their evening wear? And then they were like, oh my goodness, what about bridal? And I am always one to listen and keep being aware 
as to what is going on in our community. I felt the need, I saw the need, and decided to jump at it. Tell me about that need and how you heard that yeah. and how you responded to that. Well, I, I'm always, people tell me I have an x-ray vision. I see beyond. I, uh, I can see something and I know if it's going to move, if it's going to sell. As a matter of fact, right now I sit um, on the board of the World Trade Center in Dallas uh, with four companies that sell all over the world. I am the eyes of the, our community and of South America. So before a bridal line is launched or a quinceanera line is launched, I am one of 10 stores around the country that they fly me to New York. We preview with the designers, with the owners of the company, and uh, we rate the dresses. And like, let's say that they have 200 dresses, but they're trying to narrow it to 50. Uh, I am one of the 10 that chooses what goes out to the public. Wow, how did you earn that position? <laughs> I think the 35 years that I've been in business, I started with many of the people that are now in business and they've known my work ethics. They see how I work at market. They see how I move their product. So when I got the first invitation, they saw that I was going to be very, very honest whether I liked it, not liked it, and told them why. And uh, first they f I felt, gosh, am I being a little bit too aggressive? But once they saw my point of view being in the retail end, um, other companies heard about it and um, it worked for me. So as you're building your business now, you're raising two daughters. Yes. How was that to raise two daughters and build a business? You know what? They would do their homework in, their, in my store. <laughs> and of course, I had my husband's help. His name is Fred. And um, I always kept them busy. They played a lot of tennis. I knew that I had a commitment. You never work so hard and for so little as you do for yourself. People say, oh, you have your own business, so you don't have a boss. Yes, you have 1,000 bosses. They are your clients, your customers, the reason you survive. So you have much more than one. When you think you can take a vacation, no, you're on call 24 seven. And so I cannot tell you that it was easy, but I am so passionate about it that I can actually tell you I breastfed my children in my store. My customers grew up with my daughters. They knew their names. They bring them gifts. Uh, my, whenever I went on trips and I had the opportunity to take them, they were like eight and 10 and they would say, oh my goodness, um, this customer would love it. My suppliers would go, they know the names of your customers? <laughs> <laughs> and they'd say, yes, we live there. <laughs> but you know what? I was passionate about my work. I was uh, determined that they would work and they would prosper. That is what I had learned from my family. Whether you have to be on call 24-7, you make a commitment and you want to be the best at what you do. And your, your husband was supportive of all of Absolutely. He had another business as well? Well, we, he had been a builder, but really we had gone under when uh, interest had gone up to 18%. And so we lost that business. And so he started working, uh, we started working together. So he's helped you all along? Yes, he has. That's been a big benefit for you? For sure. So the values that you learned from your mother and father carry through as you grow your business? Yes, I actually think about my father's sayings of sometimes when I have a question, I think of what would he do? And um, the way he treated his personnel like family, the way 
everybody was first taking a vacation before he did. The way he, <clears throat> I actually thank the families of the personnel that works with us. Why? Because we're, when we're in retail, we are open seven days a week, and I know how difficult that can be for families. And so we are grateful and appreciative. I think that is some of the values that my parents taught us. Well, your father started a funeral home business in Juarez, a very compassionate business. Uh, did that, did that uh, because that's a compassionate business, did that carry over to you in your, the way you do business with people? Very, very much so, because we are there when families need us most. He also taught us how to give back to the community. For example, there is an Asilo de Ancianos in Juarez that is run by nuns for the past 50 years. These are people that have low income. They do not have to pay for a funeral. We have provided 50 years of free funeral service to the Asilo de Ancianos wow. in Juarez. Wow. And we have funeral homes that are small so that if somebody has $500, $700, they can have a decent burial. And on that note, because I have been so fortunate here in El Paso and the Juarez community in the boutique business and bridal business and quinceañera, we have now opened an outlet. A lot of the companies, a lot of my friends around the country, we get dresses, uh, brand new dresses that we can afford to sell at 75% off. 90% off designer dresses. And so anyone can have a beautiful wedding, a beautiful quinceañera, or have the opportunity to go to prom because our prices are so phenomenal at Brighton Social Outlet, right next to Canutillo High School in front of Helen of Troy. So how long has that, have you, have you been We have only ha been open there for 10 months. <laughs> and uh, we are hoping that the community hears about it and gives us the opportunity for us to take care of them. So let me ask you to reiterate the purpose for that outlet. The purpose is so that everyone has the opportunity to be a beautiful bride, a beautiful quinceañera, a beautiful prom dress, a beautiful communion dress, regardless of their income. And why, why is that important to you? I think those events leave a mark in your life. I think memories are important. The photographs are important. A story that you have to tell is important. And so we want everyone to have that opportunity. So let me ask you about your brand. Your name, Elodia, mm -hmm. is a brand. And uh, you have had billboards that are uh, colorful across town. Uh, tell me a little bit about that, about that brand. Well, Really, when I opened Elodia, I was very afraid of that even people knew how to pronounce my name because I had grown up being really nerdy and having a unique name. And it just ended up working towards an advantage. So when we did our logo of Elodia, and at that time it was the snake skin, um, mm show a little skin this season, it really caught on. You remember we had the limos. I then, I have to intervene and say, I sold the Elodia stores in 2000 when my father passed away. And I became totally involved in the funeral home businesses and the cemeteries. But when the new owner closed, I waited six more years, and that is why I reopened Elodia now across from Cielo Vista Mall. And uh, I am hoping that uh, people remember the wonderful, obviously, dresses that we had and that we still have. And tell me about Ella Blue. Ella Blue. I consider it Sophia, my daughter's store, because she did a program in college. They, both of my daughters played tennis for St. Edwards University. And in one of the business plans, she opened a boutique. She told her little group, well, if we open a boutique, we've got my mother's backing. And so they opened a business in paper, of course, and she named it Ella Blue. 
So uh, when she graduated, she always wanted to come back to El Paso. She goes, I don't know why people leave El Paso. I love it here. And um, she came up with the idea of, Mom, let's open Ella Blue. And I said, I think that's a wonderful idea. And at one point, I thought, oh my goodness, how is she going to compete with me? But you know what? When you have a business and you fail, you never learn so much as from a failure. Thank goodness she's been successful and succeeded. But I was never afraid what's going to happen. You learn from all of your experiences. So did you experience failure? Um, you know what? I have been very, very fortunate. I sold our, I opened a funeral home in Merida, Yucatan and sold it to my competitor, not because I had failed, but because I wasn't happy. And I have a motto that I live by, live, love, travel. Life has an expiration date. And I wasn't happy, I sold it. When I sold my Elodia stores, they were very successful. And really, that is when you can sell. You cannot sell when you're not successful. Right. Right. So I was fortunate enough to be able to sell my stores, not because I wanted to, but because I had to focus in the funeral homes. I figured, well, my father has worked at this 55 years. And fortunately, I had the opportunity to reopen the Elodia stores, and I'm here. So let me ask about, you come back in, so really your, your, your brand was just put on hold temporarily. Correct. Um, the people that took over the store, bought it, uh, was, was one of the reasons, I'm assuming, that they weren't successful is because they didn't have the, the reach that you had in, in getting the kinds of product that you had over the years. Really? I do not want to say why they failed other than they did not have the experience. They did not have the moxie. They did not have the um, connections, let's call it that, the networking, the passion. And I think you need all of the above. So you spent years developing those relationships. Yes, and fortunately, I still have them. And they're still growing? Very much so. Are your daughters picking up on those relationships? Oh, I'll tell you the truth. They actually saw them grow up because whenever I had the opportunity to take them on trips with me, buying trips, um, they would have to work with me. And when my daughters were around uh, 18 and 20, they continued traveling with me. And the suppliers would tell them, if you work half as much as your mother, you're hired. Mm -hmm. And so yes, one of my daughters did end up getting hired by one of our suppliers, Maury Lee. And um, then of course ended up opening Ella Blue. And uh, yes, our relationships are very strong. So, so you run you run your store, which is uh, Bridal Novias by Lodia. You run that. Well, of course, we have a wonderful manager. Her name is Gladys, okay. and uh, she's doing a phenomenal job. And so right now, I am working on the businesses more than in the businesses. I am the buyer. I do the pricing. I do the traveling. And uh, really, it takes a team to make a store work. So I cannot say I run the businesses. It is the 35 people that are our team that are the soul, the heart of the business. How do you build that team? Oh, we're very exclusive. We really interview. We want people to feel they own the business. I probably am the only person in the store that doesn't even have a key to the store. I, we believe in having people that we trust, that 
believe in the story that we are telling. We want them to feel that in these big events, like quinceañeras and brides and mother of the bride, our personnel knows the customers' names, their children, they, we sent birthday cards, anniversary cards, their family to us. And that is the type of people that we hire, people that believe in what we do, in making the person coming into the store the most important person. So how do you sense that in people that you ultimately hire? Uh, it is a process and it is also a uh, training period and a trial period as well. We look at both. So you have a three month, six month trial period. Mm -hmm. Well, let me understand a little bit about where did you learn how to build a business on those principles? Where did you learn those principles? I would have to say that when we first started, when we were growing up and we did not grow up privileged, literally, we slept behind the funeral home. And in Merida, Yucatan, I slept in one of the chapels in one of the funeral homes so I could save and not spend on an apartment. And uh, that meant that you learn what people are wanting and what people believe in. And I think I learned those principles because I started work at 16 years old. I'm 62 right now. And I still have yet a long way to retire. And um, I feel that, I can tell you that we have people working with us that have been more than 35 years with us and no, they don't want to retire. They enjoy going to work. We uh, think that's important when you don't see work as work, but rather, oh, I'm having fun with what I'm doing. You learn to hear people. Uh, how, can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I definitely believe in listening. I want to know the most about you when you come into my store because the more I know, the better I can help you. And the more I know about you and what story you want to tell, whether it's in a wedding or whether it is uh, in a quinceañera, I am here to be on the lookout those six months and try to help you as much as possible. We want you to be the model for that day of Ella Blue Bridal, Bridal Novias by Elodia, or our Brights and Social Outlet. You are the most important person that day, you're never going to be photographed as much as you are on your wedding day or quinceañera day. That is an important event in your life, and we want you to have wonderful memories. And that's why we want to listen to what you have to tell us, so that we can help you achieve that look. How important are quinceañeras in our community? Very, very important. Yes, fortunately. What do they represent? I think they represent the coming to society, the uh, now I can probably go out on a date. It is, it's um, very important, just like prom is important. So we really take it serious. So what's the future of Enovias? I always believe in growth. I feel that if you stagnate, then you should not be in it. So the best has yet to come. Well, you have a captivating story, but a captivating story doesn't come without being captivating. Would you say that because of your background and your world travels, you have 
you have found a fulfillment in who you are? Yes, I have been um, very fortunate in being able to do what we do. Um, and that's why giving back to the community with this outlet has become like a mission for us. I feel it's very important and um, I love what I do. Why is mission important to you? From um, your mission statement, whether it's helping um, communities, people in need, uh, like I was involved sending wedding dresses to Haiti. So I made it a mission to save money and be able to send wedding dresses over there to that community or send blankets to the Tarahumara Indians. Uh, it is important for us because we have been very fortunate in this community giving to us the trust for us to take care of them. Well, in our community, we've been very fortunate to have you bring Thank your you. talent to, to our community and sharing your talent. Thank uh, you. In bringing, um, bringing the world to us, in a sense. But, but um, we also um, are fortunate to have the time that we shared today in hearing your story. It's been certainly a, a, a wonderful experience for me, and um, I trust it's been a wonderful experience for our viewers. But I do want to thank you for, for, for sharing your, your values and your vision with us and for continuing to share with us your, through your stores and your business. Uh, Lilia, thank you so much for being with us and for sharing with us. Oh, thank you. I'm going to start BridalUniversity101.com and I will be putting articles on it so that people know every week what uh, to do when a big event is coming up. So I look forward to sharing it with everyone. And I thank you so much for you having invited me here. Well, thank you so much. It's really been a, a true experience. Thank you for watching. Have a good day and keep tuned for this, these shows to learn about our El Paso community. Have a good day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.